Hello, I'm Panos Khodzathanasis, and this is Asian Movie Pulse Interviews. Today, I'm here with uh, Jay Liu, whose thesis film for the USC MFA Anywhere the Wind Blows won uh, an award for outstanding achievement in producing by First Look, while it also screened at VC Film Fest and the Houston Asian American Pacific Islander Film Festival. How are you, Jay? Good, thank you. Uh, very nice to meet you, Panos. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about this interview and my film in general. Okay, great, great. So, first question, a bit political. But how? Do, what mm -hmm. is the situation in Hong Kong now? We know what happened in the past with the protests, but now it's not very clear mm -hmm. what is happening. Yeah, so 2024, which is this year, is going to mark the fifth year anniversary of the 2019 protests which were against um, an extradition bill um, against ex extraditing people um, to anywhere in the world, including mainland China. And after that, um, in 2021, there was a so-called national security law that was enacted and that basically allowed the government to, um, to use the law against any people or voices or opinions that they didn't like. And this year in 2024, that law was upgraded to um, Article 23 in our constitution, which is basically a similar concept of uh, so-called martial law, or you know, people call it a draconian law to impose against any um, freedoms people had. Um, so the response by the people has mostly been uh, immigration or migration to other countries. Um, so since since COVID really, um, I think the latest numbers have risen up to 700,000 people have left wow. Hong Kong, which is 10% of the city's population before. Um, obviously, there's some fluctuation in the numbers, different ways of you know accounting and different authorities. But yeah, generally, there's been a big loss in the in the um, population and talent in the city, which has formed this kind of new global diaspora of new um, overseas Hong Kongers communities in places like uh, Manchester, UK, which is maybe one of the biggest ones, London, in the US, there's East Coast, West Coast. So Hong Kongers are just kind of like widespread across the world now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, this is a question I always wanted to ask. Uh, right, right now, mm -hmm. if you meet like someone from China, are you kind? I don't know. Do you hate him from the get go? I mean, how? What's the situation between the Chinese and the Hong Kongese? Let's say. Mm -hmm. I think it's complicated in the way that I try to reflect in my film. I think online, um, in twenty nineteen, as well as nowadays, when when you're online and you're anonymous, you're in like a message board or forum or something you can say whatever you want. You can say the most extreme things. You can say like, I hate all the Chinese people or whatever, you know, but I think in real life, it's more complicated than that. You know, like there are obviously Chinese people who sympathize with the cause or there are, um, you know, there, there are people you meet and, you know, you're friends with them, and, you know, or there are people in Hong Kong who have careers in China, which is, um, one of the themes that I covered in my movie. So like, I think the situation is more complicated than that. It's like, well, how do you navigate your career or some things that people can't change with their beliefs? And, you know, yeah, that that's one of the things that I was interested in exploring with my film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, you also included an LGBTQ theme. Can you tell me a bit mm -hmm. about that? Yeah, um, so um, I'm a queer filmmaker and I think I felt like when I was making this movie, which is, you know, as you said, it's my thesis for a master's degree, like I felt like it had to be the most personal version of the story that I could tell. It had to come from my heart and I felt like there was no way I could make it without acknowledging that I'm queer or that it has to be queer and um. Yeah, so I was just trying to look for like what is the most heartfelt, most personal version of the story that I can tell. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, which of the two protagonists do you identify with the most? Would you say? I think um, I wrote a lot of myself into Alex, who is the protagonist. But um, I think at the same time we're pretty different. Like I'm not actually an activist, um, at least not in that you know 
democracy lobbying campaigning kind of way and um I think because I'm still a pretty new filmmaker I'm pretty limited in my writing so I think I wrote myself into both of the characters but definitely more into Alex yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay and uh, if you have included some scenes which like break the tone they're like dreamlike delirious scenes mm -hmm. and can, can you tell me a bit about those yeah I think those film uh, those scenes came later in the development I was just kind of looking for what is the most visceral thing that I could do like to me, it was very important when I was making a film that I had to look for an image or um, idea that was so visceral and that would be so impactful to the viewer. And I think the dreams were a good way to do that just because they were so kind of like, like the image was more powerful. I, I could make them more powerful in the dream sequences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And the, can you tell me a bit about the cinematography in the film, what you wanted to do in the visual aspect mm -hmm. of the team? Yeah, I think cinematography-wise, I definitely wanted to combat some of the more disappointing trends in student digital cinematography that I've seen recently, which is very hard, I think, at my level and with the resources that I have. Like, I think I, I did think about shooting it on film, but I, I guess I wasn't brave enough to do that with the student, you know, with the student budget and student production. And, um, but I definitely, I definitely was looking for like, you know, high contrast. I, I wanted to avoid like the shallow depth of field look that I think a lot of student films just kind of lazily default to, you know, I wanted to do something that was high contrast and I wanted to do something that wasn't necessarily the prettiest like I wanted to do something that is you know kind of dirty and like it would make the image more um um you know more impactful and my cinematographer you know had this idea of shooting the film with um with anamorphic lenses even though the film is in the spherical aspect ratio it was actually shot most of it was shot with um anamorphic lenses which kind of created this kind of like more dreamlike quality, as you said, with the lines being distorted and the, you know, the lens flares and things like that. And um, and we kind of played with, okay, experimented with uh, some scenes are gonna be shot anamorphically and some scenes, some scenes are gonna be spherical. And we kind of wanted to give different scenes a different texture and feeling. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me a bit how you shot those scenes with the police, which are visually for mm -hmm. me were the most impressive in the film? Yeah. Um, it you know i'm gonna make it sound really dramatic and hard but like <laughs> compared to a like huge hollywood production it's just actually still very simple and small we shot it on a, a sound stage we have at school which is like i'm very luckily my school has a few sound stages available um they're not like huge but they're still like pretty well equipped compared to other film schools i've been told and you know we set up a black curtain behind on the wall and then we had originally i wanted to have more extras obviously as a director i wanted to have you know the more extras the better the more stunt performers the better but i think at the end we ended up with five stunt performers and one stunt coordinator and then the other all of the other were just untrained extras who showed up on the day and we were like you have to fight today <laughs> and um so yeah but we had a stunt coordinator which was very very helpful and um, the few stunt coordinators who have credits in in uh, because you know the film was shot in Los Angeles, so you know they work in stunts in other films. So that was very good to have. Mm -hmm. So uh, the school also provides the extras, or you have to search for yourself. It, 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 we have to search for them ourselves, but I think having the school name helps saying it's like a USC production, and our school has an agreement with the Screen Actors Guild. In America, uh, the SAG, which um, allows us to use SAG actors, both union and non-union actors. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me a bit about editing also, what you wanted to do with the pace of the movie? Mm -hmm. um, so I edited the movie with, with a friend, with a co-editor, which was great because I think th their opinion really like was really important and kind of really pushed me into doing things that I didn't think I would I would do myself. Um, one of the things, for example, is like the opening is 
completely different from how it was written and shot. Like the opening was much longer before and um and you know it had some scenes with Alex at his home setting up the character or something. And you know, but you know, when you're making a short film, the entire time you're thinking, okay, how do I shorten this till I can get to the main point as quickly as possible? So we kind of shorted it, shorted it, and then we ended up with this kind of, you know, him standing on the street, and there's this kind of dream-like element, which was not exactly how it was written. So that's one of the things that I learned when editing the film. Like, like I like I regret not writing it that way and I could have shot it better, but you know, that's some of the things that I saved in the editing process. Um, but yeah, I think for the rest of the film, like the 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 really big restaurant scene, for example, it's pretty much edited in the way that I envisioned it. We we still cut like a few lines in the restaurant scene, which I, again I didn't I wouldn't have done it myself. Like um um but it, it it turned out pretty well. And but yeah, like kind of like the the reactions, all that were just kind of like already in my head when I envisioned the film. And yeah, I think the rest of it was pretty smooth. It was just the edits at the opening that went through the biggest kind of restructuring in the editing process. Sounds like you had the fight or <laughs> not really. I, I think I was pretty agreeable. I hope to think I was pretty agreeable and I I was because it's what I wanted to do anyway. I just didn't really have a solution as to how do I get to the movie as early as possible. And I'm grateful that I found a solution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And can you tell me a bit about the casting for the two actors in particular? How did that work? Yeah, it was very difficult. I think um, I, I think when I wrote it or when I thought about the idea of the movie in my head, I already knew it was going to be difficult because I had to cast two Cantonese-speaking actors in Los Angeles who you know, who are the right age, the right gender, who looked the part, and their Cantonese had to be fluent. Like, they couldn't sound like um, like immigrants, like second-generation immigrants. They had, they had to sound like people from Hong Kong. So I kind of knew it was going to be a challenge. And I think even, like, months before I formally started the pre-production process, I was already kind of looking for actors in the L.A. area. And Ray Cam, who plays Brandon in my film, is one of the actors that I looked at. And I knew he had a bit of an accent, um, but I think everything else, he was right for the part in terms of looks and like personality wise. He was like exact, almost exactly how I wrote it. So I, I went back to other films that, you know, I've seen recently, like for example, um, in for example, in Decision to Leave, Tang Wei, she speaks Korean and she doesn't speak Korean. She has a huge accent in that movie, but you know, no one finds it a problem. Or in in Lust Caution, for example, not all people not a lot of people know that Tony Lam has a big Mandarin accent in that movie that kind of takes you out of it. But you know, it doesn't because the performance works. So I just kind of like I took a leap of faith, I guess. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna cast this guy, even though he has a bit of an accent. And people from Hong Kong, when they see it, they're gonna be like, why is this guy have an accent? But like I think I just kind of justified it in my head with story reasons, with character background reasons. I kind of came up with a character background for him that would make the accent work. And everything else, you know, he was perfect. And then Alex, the protagonist, he couldn't have an accent, I know for sure. Like, he had to be 100% authentic and local. And, you know, when we were searching, I was worried. But then very luckily, this guy, Glenn he kind of just fell on my lap because he, well, that's inappropriate. He just kind of <laughs> like very luckily came to my life. Um, he is a student at the USC School of Dramatic Arts, which is like the acting school in my in my school, my university. Um, he's a actor in the theater program. And, you know, he's from Hong Kong. He speaks perfect Cantonese and he he was good, I think. And he had chemistry with uh, with Ray, the other actor. And the only problem was he was a bit young. I think he wasn't even, I don't even know, I don't even know if he was 20 when he did the film. He was either 19 or 20. Um, so I had to age the characters down a bit, but everything else, he was perfect. So it was just super lucky that he exists in, <laughs> in my school at, at the same time as me. And um, I wouldn't have been able to make the film without those two guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, any future projects? Are you working on anything next? 
yeah um so one of the things that i'm working on is a documentary that i'm shooting soon is actually developed from my film from anywhere than close um so if you remember in the in the climax of the film there was a taxi in the background um which was i think some people find it very amazing that there's a taxi there including myself um <laughs> it, it's it's actually the only operational tax hong kong taxi replica in the entire us which i just kind of very luckily found like like i remember seeing this car somewhere maybe in the news or something so one night i was like okay how do i make this scene better and i suddenly just thought of this taxi and I didn't even know if it actually existed or not, but I just kind of, I just have this memory of maybe it exists. So I just, I spent like three hours on the internet looking for the owner. And then I found him and then I messaged him on Instagram. I was like, okay, like I have this film and I really want you to do it. Do you, do you want, do you, do you, does your taxi want to be a part of it? And then he offered to do it for free actually, which was really, really great. Um, I did pay him, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, we kind of developed this, I guess, um, friendship the the owner of the car he's he's actually kind of my age yeah he's my age uh the owner of the taxi he's from los angeles and he's a second generation hong konger and um i was just kind of amazed by this story like he has this in like insanely convincing and real replica of a hong kong taxi just sitting in los angeles and he bought it during covid he he bought the car from Japan because it's a Toyota. He bought the Toyota from Japan during COVID. And then he spent COVID like spray painting it the exact same exact shade of red. You know, he bought all the props and like got the font and everything right. And I was just kind of like, this is a pretty crazy story. Like he's so like detailed and obsessed with, you know, constructing this Hong Kong cultural icon. And then it started to get me thinking like, I can make a film about this this person's you know obsession and dedication and how it relates to you know Hong Kong culture nowadays. I think one of the phenomenon one of the phenomena that we've observed is people in Hong Kong are it's very difficult for them to you know preserve and care about Hong Kong culture because not just because of work and life to, or but also because of you know the government situation. Uh, but at the same time, like I said, there are so many kind of diaspora groups all over the world. You know, we're preserving Hong Kong culture. Excuse me. We're like screening Hong Kong movies. You know, we have, you know, Hong Kong book fairs, art fairs. You know, we're doing all this work to preserve and spread Hong Kong culture. And the taxi is kind of um, related to that. You know, this guy, he bought this taxi. He he drives it around in L.A. You know, he has an Instagram account of, you know, 10,000 something followers just wow. kind of documenting this Hong Kong icon while the icon itself in Hong Kong is not necessarily, you know, super beloved. So I think there was this interesting irony to me that maybe you want to make a documentary about him and the taxi. So that's what I'm going to be working on next. It's going to be a short documentary kind of inspired or derived from anywhere to wind blows. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess that's it. Thank you very much for mm -hmm. your time. Yeah, uh -huh. thank you for your time as well. Okay. And good, yeah, good I luck. hope you enjoyed the film. Thank I, you. I did. Good luck with everything. And I, actually, I have to say that I really hope mm -hmm. that you can make this short into a feature at some point. I think there is enough mm -hmm. material there to make features. Yeah. I guess it's difficult. Originally, I didn't think of it that way. And then the more I thought about it, the more it kind of merged with another feature idea that I've been developing. So now it's kind of become a proof of concept short film when originally it wasn't going to be one. So um yeah, I am kind of writing a feature version of it. So hopefully that will see the world someday. Okay, great. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much. And keep in touch. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. You do. Bye. Bye. Okay, you ready? Kawako Beardy, wicked stuff. Whoa, whatever that means. Name